So in 2003, we did a study called Basins at Risk, where we really examined the relationship between change in institutions, and, um, and as I say, found that uh, where change exceeds the institutional capacity to absorb the change, that's a setting for conflict. We also looked very systematically at the relationship between conflictive uh, uh, events and cooperative events, and found at the time, to our great surprise, that most of the world, when they do anything about water, they cooperate. About two to one rather than conflict. Uh, and since then, I think what we've found that, that's been consistent, th that relationship has held. It doesn't matter the scale, and that's really interesting. We did this for the state of Oregon. We did this for the upper Colorado. We just updated all the event data for the Basins at Risk uh, database. And again, two to one, whenever we do anything, it's cooperate uh, over water. I think we've become a little bit more nuanced about thinking, and that's thanks uh, in part to um, Mark Zaitun's work who really helped us remember that conflict and cooperation also come hand in hand. So I think now we think in terms of, of the stresses of scarcity or the stresses of change then leading to, to uh, focused attention and often uh, cooperation coming right out, right out of that same process. Uh, so I think the relations are similar. Uh, certainly the basins that were at risk then are not at risk now, thankfully, because there's been a lot of international attention to bolstering the institutions. So institutional capacity in most of the basins that we identified at the time has really been brought up, and there are a lot of new basin organizations in, in those basins. Uh, so I think if we were to look now, um, we would look elsewhere. I think the, the, uh, we'd look for places where there are unilateral development plans without cooperative mechanisms. For example, uh, most of the rivers that come out of China, uh, China's got a uh, huge energy uh, needs and, and they're trying to address a lot of that through dams. Most of those rivers have downstream riparians with whom they don't have agreements to mitigate the impacts of dams. Uh, and these are the major rivers of Asia. This is Indus, uh, Ganges, Salwin, Mekong, uh, all the way through and rivers into, into Russia and into the Caucasus. So uh, the, the same relationship holds true and we'd, we'd look for the same kinds of uh, areas where people are building things without agreements or where um, uh, where there are no agreements to begin with. Uh, the other interesting thing, we've also brought it down into the, into the subnational level in the Western U.S., uh, and, and the same thing holds true, that, that we've often assumed that scarcity in the Western U.S. is the, is the cause of conflict. And what we found here is, is the thing that really triggers uh, conflictive settings is actually a new uh, legal requirement. So a new endangered species or a new requirement for the, for, uh, for the agricultural community. When these things happen and you haven't had the conversations in advance, how do we mitigate for the impacts of these new legal requirements? That then causes the, uh, these settings of, of conflict. So I think the relationship holds. Sudden changes, whether they're physical or institutional, are the things that we watch for uh, as red flags.